Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 1st of January 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on board. And uh, we're going to go through a lot of uh, quite detailed information tonight, but also hopefully have a bit of fun on the way through. And uh, appreciate all the uh, all the comments. Um, <laughs> Blurred Squid says I'm back. Great. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, um, RCC says always like to catch a live show when I can. Solid work. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, there's something about being um, involved in the live rather than just the replay. The replay is good, though. You know, it's worth <laughs> it's worth uh, catching if you don't get the live. And I'm just making a, a bit of a note of some of these um, uh, other postcodes that people are asking about. Um, I've probably already got uh, a list longer than my arm, but that's OK. We'll try and get to them. Um, just as normal, I want to just uh, take you through some of the um, normal um, introductory stuff first. And uh, the reason for that is that I just know that there are a few people who perhaps have not been on one of these streams before and won't necessarily know what we're at. So it's important that people um, get to understand a bit more about that. So that's what we're going to try and do. Um, and I'm going to start with the running order just in terms of this introduction. Um, then um, once we've got the introduction sorted out, uh, we'll go through the house rules, we'll talk about our models, we'll run some key slides and just give you some context and background for the discussion. Then the major part of the show will be questions and answers, and we typically run for about an hour and a half or so. And um, through that, uh, we'll be able to get into some quite detailed areas, but shaped by what you want to ask about, really. And uh, then we'll sign off at the end, so that's how it goes. And in terms of house rules, I always say this, but I just want to make quite sure that you all understand. Um, we don't offer financial advice here. Financial advice requires to understand individual personal circumstances. We can't do that. So what we do here is essentially just discuss the principles and also some of the main analysis that we've been doing based on what we've been looking at. Do play nice in the chat room. It is moderated. No racial slurs, please. And this is out of the 1st of June 2021, if you're watching this in replay. Also, Use at Walk the World if you want to get my attention, if specifically if you want to ask a question, because there's always loads of stuff going on in the chat. I don't necessarily get across all of it, simply because there's just way too much. And we've also enabled Super Chat, which allows you to do a couple of things. The first is to make a contribution, if you'd like to do that, to help run the, uh, the, the shows that we make here. Um, we don't do this for profit. We do this because we think it's important. But also, if you want to get your question to the top of the list, you can also use Super Chat for that. Now, just in terms of our core models, uh, for those who haven't uh, come here before, we survey households all the time, 52,000 households through the year. And that information then goes into our core market models and uh, essentially drives everything we do, including our conversations on YouTube and our other stuff on the blog. And we can cut the data and slice it and dice it different ways. We can look at different locations, different types of people through our segmentation models and all sorts of things like that. It's like a Rubik's Cube, as I often say. And that also allows us then to um, think about how that translates into different scenarios. And we'll talk about scenarios a bit later. Um, some people often um, uh, sort of s seem to think that I um, basically only have, um, you know, bearish thoughts around property. That's not true. I actually run multiple scenarios. And for the last nine months or so, there has been a positive set of scenarios. And uh, Cookie Boy actually sent me some um, historical artifacts earlier on relating to what NAB said um, just a few months ago, sort of last year. And in some cases, they were talking about prices going down 7% this year and, you know, last year as well. And of course, CBA a few months ago, uh, middle of the, um, the pandemic, was talking about prices 32% um, down. So, you know, everybody has some um, different views. I run scenarios. And the reason I run scenarios is that it's too uncertain to be precise about precisely how this is going to play out. So we'll talk about scenarios again down the track. Now in terms of um, uh, that, what it also means is I can take my core market model and look at the stress data, the price trajectory data, the buying and selling intentions, migration data, the economic data, bang it through the core market model, which is my analytic engine, and then at a postcode level, at a uh, a rolled up level, a region, state or Australia level, I can then make some estimations about what home prices are doing. And we'll be uh, talking about our price engine 
and uh, stress engine shortly and uh, share some information on that. Now let me just turn to the DFA one to one. The reason I'm doing this here is because tonight I'm going to offer um, one free session for one viewer who would like to participate um, on the DFA one to one. Now the DFA one to one, what is it? Well, it's uh, essentially a conversation about an individual suburb. And uh, I can't give specific financial advice, but I can uh, analyze data around a particular suburb within a postcode and uh, look at the underlying trends. And I can talk about stress and home prices and the other issues that are going on. I, of course, made a few shows over the over the months from the output of the one to one. Um, you can book a time, you know, normally for me, uh, about an hour is typically what we spend talking together. And um, normally that would be 250 plus GST, payable in advance, but um, there's a five to three to five week delay at the moment because I've got so many on. But I am going to offer tonight one lucky person is going to have the opportunity to get a one for one conversation free. Now, to make that work, um, there are two things. The first is that um, we're going to pose, in fact, Smooth Operator is going to pose a trivial question, or I should say a trivia question, because it's not really a trivial question, <coughs> a trivia question a bit later. And uh, what we will then do is we will um, get people to answer the question and to be eligible to go into the draw to um, get the one-to-one -one for free, the way it goes is like this. You need to actually answer the trivia question from Smooth Operator, and that question needs to be the right answer. Now, we won't necessarily declare early on what the right answer is, even if somebody says the right answer. We're going to let this run till 9 o'clock, and then what we will do is uh, tell you what the right answer is. And the other thing is that um, we would like to encourage you, when you put your answer in, to make a contribution, contribution via the Super Chat to help cover the costs of running the, the channel. So, um, you know, that's the model of uh, what we're going to do. So, uh, essentially, uh, when Smooth Operator sets the question up shortly, um, you've then got up till 9 o'clock to put your answer in, and then I'll go back over the chat after the show, pull out all the answers that were correct. I'll then run them through a draw. And tomorrow night in the show then, I will announce the winner of the person who gets a free go of a DFA one-to-one. -one. OK, so that's how we're going to do it. Um, should be fun and uh, good luck to everybody. And uh, I'll let Smooth um, pick the uh, moment to put the, uh, the trivial question up. As I say, we won't tell you necessarily straight away whether you got the right answer or the wrong answer so people can answer multiple times and you know put different answers in but at nine o'clock we will then announce what the true answer is and then people can judge whether they could be in the running for the draw um, and as i say encouraging you to put a contribution in via super chat when you put your answer in okay so that's that now let me go on with my presentation just to say that the rba um, held again, no surprise at all, absolutely no surprise. The uh, GDP is forecast to grow by four three quarter percent this year and three and a half percent over 2022. Supported by fiscal measures, blah blah blah, the same sort of stuff. So nothing really new there. Progress in reducing unemployment has been faster than expected. They said unemployment rate declining to 5.5 percent. Now, of course, that is on the um, official ABS number. The true number is somewhat higher because there are still lots of people not looking for work, and in fact, the participation rate came back a bit. Job vacancies are high, that's true, and they're expecting a 5% unemployment rate by the end of this year. We will see, and we will also see whether those labour shortages are real. Of course, um, the lockdown in Victoria, and uh, sympathy to everybody in the state of Victoria and in Melbourne, um, that may have an impact as well. And then they went on to say that despite the recovery in the economy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, wage um, pressure is subdued. The pickup inflation and wages growth is expected. It's likely to be any gradual and modest. Central scenario inflation in underlying terms is expected to be 1.5% in 21, 2% by mid-2023. Although there is the possibility in the short term of a temporary rise to above 3% in the June quarter because of the reversal of some COVID-19 related price reductions. So this is very similar to Jerome Powell's 
temporary transitory, transitory issues, not real underlying inflation. And of course, one of the key points I have to make is that under, underlying inflation and uh, tr you know, full inflation isn't necessarily capturing everything. Costs of uh, houses, for example, not really in the numbers at all. So that's a little bit um, one-sided, but nevertheless, that's what they're saying. And, um, you know, when you actually take that back, they went on to say, well, housing markets have strengthened further. It's important that lending standards are maintained. Well, I can tell you that uh, my research has shown that lending standards are being loosened. People are getting bigger loans. Average first-time buyer loan is now 15% bigger than it was uh, a year plus ago. And uh, we're seeing more interest-only loans and we're seeing more investment loans all being made at the moment. So the banks are having a field day. And, of course, NAB, for example, discounted their interest uh, sorry, their investment loan to try and pull some of that through before it all um, gets a bit tighter later in the year. So I'm afraid the banks are already reducing their lending standards. And of course, the other point to make there is that in June, the removal of the responsible lending legislation is going to come back into Parliament. Frydenberg still wanting to put it in on the ostensibly argued position that we need even greater lending. No, we don't. We've got plenty of lending. And uh, as I've discussed a few times, credit creation is all about um, simply creating more and more and more credit. That is leading to more and more debt. That debt, of course, has to be repaid at some point. And we've got some of the highest indebted households, businesses and government. Of course, debt as well is pretty high. Uh, and of course, some of our um, corporates have borrowed internationally and so that they have also a considerable exposure internationally, too. So this is a big deal. Um, they also made the point that uh, next month they're going to look at whether to retain the 2024 bond as the target or move it out. This is all about yield control. Uh, they've been manipulating the yield curves, of course, since, for the last few months, and particularly the three-year rate and below. And um, they basically are saying, well, we'll look at it, but we'll wait and see. They're going to continue to... Um, do the bond purchases and uh, continues to place a high priority on a return to full employment. So in other words, never mind interest rates, never mind credit. It doesn't matter if credit continues to blossom because it's all about full employment, low in, low, lower unemployment rates. And that, of course, is the latest excuse they've got for uh, what, doing what they're doing. Uh, by the way, the Fed's aping the same thing, or I'm not sure who's copying who, but they're talking about the same as well. Uh, they also made the point that the term funding facility, which is the very cheap money for the banks, is uh, going to end at the 30th of June. So far, they've drawn $134 billion from the facility. There's a further $75 billion available. And uh, that means that the banks have got very, very low cost funding for the next three years. And that will continue to support low borrowing costs until mid-2024. Of course, the banks, though, will have to drive their funding from other sources beyond that, and that includes um, probably trying to get more term deposits uh, from um, savers and also accessing international financial markets, those returns will be higher than the 0.1%. So that's going to put up with pressure on bank margins. And in fact, I did a show today with um, one of the analysts at Mozo talking about the upward pressure now on interest rates, not from the cash rate movement from the Reserve Bank, but from market dynamics because of the term funding facility beginning to end, because of the fact that um, deposit rates are beginning to rise just a little bit at the moment. And we're also seeing some of the really cheap mortgages that were available disappearing as well. So margin compression and margin um, contention is going to be one of those very significant issues ahead. That's going to put pressure on the banks, of course. And the way that the banks are handling at the moment is they're trying to suck in as much cheap money and as many, make as many loans as they can to build their book as quickly as they can ahead of the tightening, which is going to come later in the year. And the last point they made was that the um, whole strategy is to try and generate wages growth. Um, it's unlikely, though, that it's going to be materially higher than currently until 2024 at the earliest. In other words, folks don't accept don't expect a pay rise above inflation. Uh, we are in this for the long haul. And what that basically means is that there's no get out of jail card. Back in the early 2000s, if you look at what happened, there was a lot of growth in lending, but also mortgages was more serviceable because people had price 
um, sorry, they had income growth much higher than price rises. And that meant that they were able to get out of jail. There's no get out of jail card this time around. Income growth is going to be static in real terms. It's been static for many people since 2011, 2012. And what that basically means is that there is no wriggle room. So if, if you get commit yourself to a really big loan, um, you know, you could definitely be under the pump if rates start to rise or if the employment situation goes off the boil. And of course, we do have the lockdown in Victoria now to contend with as well, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, just in terms of the financial aggregates, I made a show on this yesterday, so I won't uh, uh, do it in detail. But it is worth noting that the total growth in credit was very low. In April 2021 for the year 1.3 percent compared with 3.5 percent last year business credit is down three percent analyzed and um, housing credit is up 4.4 percent so housing credit is higher and you can look at that on this chart this is actually the overall housing up 4.39 percent uh, annualized own occupied credit up 6.23 and is getting quite high now Investment lending is also moving up at 1.3% annualised, so that's um, quite a change from a few months ago, but of course still way, way down from where we were in 2015 and 16 before APRA turned the taps a bit tighter. And personal credit down 7.79%. Now that's still down from where it was, but of course that doesn't include buy now, pay later, which is not regarded as a credit product, according to the Reserve Bank, it does not require responsible lending obligations on it, so it's another great uh, backdoor way of stoking the economy without actually um, uh, being have to report the credit. And uh, business credit down 2.98%, in other words, pretty much 3% over the year. That's a really bad issue because what that means is that essentially businesses are not borrowing. And uh, without the businesses borrowing, um, we are not going to see significant momentum in the economy. Housing is not the same as growing the overall economy. RBA, please note. Treasury, please note. And by the way, just in terms of the credit aggregates, uh, overall credit up 1.25% over the last 12 months. Broad money down now to 675 And of course, that's because we have those big stimulus packages there, which are now working out the system. So, And it's very interesting to see that divergence between broad money and um, the credit uh, momentum. Now, Across the banks, this is uh, another chart from last night. It's very interesting to see that CBA and Westpac and Macquarie are all driving very firmly on both investor and occupied lending. NAB is um, doing own occupied, but its investment portfolio has gone backwards. One reason why I think they discounted their uh, interest rates on variable investment loans. And then you can see some of the smaller players, NZ, some gone a little bit backwards. Now, of course, the thing to highlight about these particular charts is this is a net position. And it doesn't include any securitization that may be underway. So if the bank actually takes loans off its balance sheet through securitization, they disappear out of the APRA statistics. So this does not give you a very good read necessarily on precisely what's happening. But it's nevertheless quite interesting and it highlights the different strategies between the different lenders. Not all of them are doing the same thing, as you can see there. But interestingly, some of the smaller banks are also quite active in terms of their uh, lending strategies at the moment. Now, if I look at um, some statistics from the chart pack, this has came out uh, the other day from the RBA. It's very interesting to notice that whilst the gr growth for owner-occupied lending is, you know, reasonably strong, still a bit lower than where it used to be, but investor lending is still way, way down from where it was. So, well, let's not get carried away with the news that investment lending is um, is booming. It's not really. It's just moving up a little bit from where it was from a very, very low base. And it's also worth noting that they also show that housing and business and personal lending, um, you know, it's a bit like what I just showed you. It really is a problem. Business lending is falling away. Um, personal is moving up from a very low base, but it's still negative. So it's not falling as much as it was. It's all housing. So basically all of the eggs are in the housing sector lending basket. And it's interesting that uh, UBS published some research today that made the point that um, the record low public sector wages are weighing on total wage index. And they do expect to see some bounce back, particularly in public sector wages um, over the next uh, couple of years, maybe less in the private sector. Private sector has tended to languish for a long time. Um, and they also make the point that um, the wages uh, have slowed more in Australia 
than many major other economies. And um, you know there might be things like wage freezes, etc., which could unwind. But if you look at Australia compared with the eurozone, compared with the US, well, Australia is the bottom of the pack. So we are not getting income growth. We haven't had income growth since 2011, 2012 in real terms. And uh, the prospect from the Reserve Bank is no change until 2024. So don't expect a pay rise anytime soon. Now, the other interesting data that came out today from Roy Morgan and ANZ Research is that there was a significant dip in confidence. It fell 3.8% in Melbourne, but actually was more sharply down in Brisbane, down 4.7%, and Sydney down 4.5%. Now, that's really important to understand. So we don't have just a sort of local crisis in Victoria or in Melbourne. This is actually hitting confidence nationally. And of course, it also is raising questions about travelling into state, and it's raising questions about when the international borders will open. They're still saying middle of next year, could be later than that now. And, uh, you know, Roy Morgan did make the point, of course, the absence of job keeper for this episode means we need to be alert to worse results than experienced to date, because there are many people who are actually financially strapped, as we'll see shortly. And the latest lockdowns and the lack of job keeper um, is a real issue. I'm amazed that the federal government has not actually pulled the job keeper card back out on the table again for at least Victoria. They probably will have to if this goes on. But there are many people out of work now who are expecting to be in work. And uh, many of those are leading, living hand to mouth and therefore it's a real issue. I'd also make the point that dwelling approvals came out today from ABS. The number of dwellings fell 8.6% in April in season adjusted terms. That of course was after a big rise in March. And it's interesting that private sector houses rose 4.6% in April. That's a new record of 15,063. Well, there you go. That's the result of all of the stimulus and, you know, the homeland packages that were actually um, uh, f funded by government uh, earlier on. Um, private sector dwellings excluding houses decreased 28.6% in April, driven by a large fall in approvement apartments in Victoria. And you can see there the bifurcation between the two. It's very important to understand that whilst the housing sector is being stoked by, you know, government stimulus, the units are falling off a cliff. And I'm afraid that the units look to me to be continuing to languish for some time. And uh, you can look across the interesting uh, data by state there. Um, Dwelling approvals rose in New South Wales up 12.3, with WA 5.5, South Australia 3.4. They fell in Victoria down 23.5, Queensland down 14.3, and Tasmania down 2.5. And private sector houses rose in New South Wales up 30%, Queensland 8.3%, South Australia 2.7%. And there were falls in Victoria down 5% and WA down 3.8%. So this is not a national story. This is different places around the country behaving in different ways. And, and so we shouldn't get too carried away by these statistics, which, by the way, are often a bit noisy in best of times. But, of course, the uh, media release from the HIA conveniently just picked detached house building approvals and then celebrated that peak that I mentioned earlier on. They didn't really mention the um, units much at all. But, of course, as I showed you, the unit sector is um, definitely in a different uh, part of the uh, spectrum when it comes to what's going on. Now, let's turn to my mortgage stress data. So, firstly, the overall mortgage stress for May, so this is up till, um, you know, a couple of days ago, really, uh, was actually, again, at 41.1%. It went up very, very slightly compared with last month, but hardly at all. Uh, and the household debt to ratio is still 180.4. There's no new data from the Reserve Bank on that. So we can see there that we've got a lot of debt in the system and we've got um, a lot of mortgage stress. And mortgage stress compared with um, where we were in February at 32.9% is significantly higher. Now we can look at what that translates to. And I'm going to start with last month's. I want to draw your attention specifically to the situation with regards to the mortgage stress at 1.5 at 41.28 and rental stress at 1.7 which was 35.04 and investor stress which was 25.94% or 846,000 so that's the starting point if i then go to the may statistics you can see there that the mortgage stress has hardly moved it's 41.13 but the rental stress has gone up so just to go back 1.7 
to 1.95. That's a significant hike in the number of people who are in rental stress. And we also see um, that in percentage terms, so from 35 to 38.24%. And if you look at the investor stress, in April it was 25.94, now it's 26.21, so that's a bit higher. And also the overall financial stress at 39.25% is up from 37.98%. So we are seeing the situation where thanks to rental stress, as well as the mortgage investor stress, and those two things of course are linked, uh, households are actually in worse shape in May than they were in April. And just in terms of that, I want to highlight three things. So rentals, a number of people are now not protected because they were essentially given um, protection from being uh, forced to pay rents or indeed um, you know, any rent rises. Rent rises have been starting to flow through quite dramatically from investors. The second is that a number of renters have actually left to try and find cheaper accommodation elsewhere. And the third thing, that some of those renters are now being asked to pay a number of months in advance for the next place that they're renting. So that's one of the other factors in this research that we found. And what that basically means is that it's a very costly experience now for many renters to move and to try and find somewhere else and yet they're being forced to because in some cases property investors are now trying to sell their investment property because the rental returns are just pretty, pretty awful while the capital appreciation is rising because of the investment property uh, trajectory that's going on. And that means that uh, many renters are really under the pump. Now, I'll be able to show you in more detail which postcodes are affected, but I'll just, before I do that, I'll just go back to the, um, uh, the uh, mortgage. Um, there we go. Let's go to the mortgage stress. So, this is the stress for um, top postcodes. So, I've done it here by sorted by the number of households who are in mortgage stress and the percentage of borrowing households that are actually in mortgage stress. Now just to be clear, I define mortgage stress as money in, money out. How much money is coming into the, uh, the, the household each month, how much is going out, including whether it's a rent payment or whether it's a mortgage payment, right? If they've actually got more money going out than coming in, they're classified as stressed. Um, they can tap credit cards, they can pull down deposits, they can use buy now, pay later, whatever, right? And I would make the point, because I picked this up the other day, one or two people have been accusing me of double counting. In other words, if you put money on a credit card, um, that counts as two debts. No, it doesn't. It only counts as one transaction. So there's no double counting in my modelling. So I'm afraid that well, those people who are trying to criticise it as being inaccurate are completely wrong. So the postcode in the country with the highest mortgage stress is 6065 tapping and there are 9,661 households in that WA postcode 6065, 63.83%. Then we go to Victoria to Nary Warren uh, in the high growth corridor again. Um, there we've got 73% of households and that's about 8,800. Then we go again to another Victorian Postcode Berwick Huckaway, um, that's uh, 3806 at 84.6. Then we go to Sydenham in Victoria at 75% with another 7,700 households. Pagnanum at 72.62%, that's postcode 3810. And then we go to Cranbourne. So there's a bunch of Victorian postcodes in that outer suburban ring. That's a big deal. Then we go across to WA again. And then we come back to Victoria to Roxburgh Park, another one. And then we come back to New South Wales. And so it goes on. And then we go up to Queensland. So we've got um, Ipswich in the area around there with 62.86% uh, or 5,700. Uh, then we go to Camp Hill in Queensland. And then we're back down to Victoria and New South Wales. So these are the really stressed areas. And I'll show you some mapping shortly just to um, take that a bit further. But so that's the starting point for the mortgage stress series. Now let me run it through to the rental stress. So now this is those in rental stress. Remember I showed you that rental stress had gone up, right? So the postcode with the highest rental stress in terms of count of households is 2770. And that includes places like Lethbridge Park, 
and uh, there are 9,218. 9, then we go to West Gosford, which is, of course, um, up in um, the Central Coast. People are surprised by this, but there's a lot of people there, 77.87% or 9,109 in postcode 2250. And then we go to the area here, uh, which is, again, Jarvis Bay and uh, places like that. Um, you know, again, regional parts of New South Wales, but a very significant set of pressures with regard to renting. One of the things we've happened here is that rents are going up very much, very fast. And so there are more people struggling to uh, be able to rent at all anything in some of these regional areas, and that's why the rental stress is uh, rising. And I think it will continue for some time yet, partly because of the migration to regional areas and partly by the fact that the demand for property for rent is rising and therefore rents are going up there. It's very different when you look uh, closer into the city, by the way. Then we go to Greystains, places like Westmead. Um, that's a 2145 with 67% there. Then we go to Queensland to a mill bank. Uh, that includes a whole bunch of uh, areas there. You can see them listed. But Bundaberg is the critical area. Uh, that is really where the centre of gravity is. Um, so 48% of people in Bundaberg who are renting. Then we come to Bondi. So, you know, Bondi Beach and Bondi, 72%. Um, and that's a big deal. So a lot of people closer into the city uh, are beginning to find it difficult. Then we go to Service Paradise. Again, a lot of migration up there, a lot of demand for rental accommodation. Prices are rising. And then we go to Cranbourne. It's funny how the same ones pop up again. Uh, so Cranbourne, 3977, 71.87%. And then we go to Blacktown in New South Wales at 73%. And then we come down to Wollongong at 66%. I'm seeing that locally in and around the Wollongong area. Again, same issues, regional prices rising, rents going up, local incomes not rising, significant pressure on households. And then we go to uh, Ipswich again and 55.8% uh, uh, around that area. And then we come to the rocks and areas around that, um, you know, New South Wales 2000. So even close into the city and Darlinghurst and Surrey Hills, got issues there too and uh, down in Victoria South Yarra uh, so wherever you look we have significant pressure on rents then if I look at stressed investors so these are property investors and this is where they um, are residing it's not necessarily where their property is but um, often it's um, in the same area but doesn't always apply. The one at the top is Melbourne, Victoria 3000 at 77.35. Of course, we have lots of issues there now with all the lockdowns, a lot of vacant properties. The vacancy rates in some areas of Melbourne, close in, are 15% and rising. And uh, a lot of the new high rise is unoccupied. So vacancies rates are very high and unoccupied buildings are, you know, very, very significant uh, on the horizon there. Walk, walk around certain parts of the uh, centre of Melbourne at night, there's nothing going on, uh, no lights on. And then if you look beyond that, we've got uh, Greystains or Went Wentworthville and Westmead at 46.58%. Then we've got Surface Paradise, so some property investors are struggling to make this work, and that's a combination of um, costs arising and uh, issues with rent. Um, of course, prices have risen dramatically up there as well, so that's another factor in the mix. And then we come to um, New South Wales around um, Baru Bay, uh, and then we come to St Kilda and then South Yarra, and then we go to Queensland, Rushcutters Bay, so, you know, 2011, areas around there. Uh, and so it goes on. And, of course, good old Mandra is still on the list, 6210, 30.53% um, of investors in difficulty. So relative to some of the others, it's not too bad, but it's still a big issue, and they're still actually seeing prices way off from where they were. And um, many investors are still underwater in a, on a capital basis as well as a cash flow basis. And South Bank is also on the list. And again, it's the same issue that so they can't let the properties and therefore they've got issues. And where you see these high stress levels, what tends to happen is that people are starting now to put their properties on the market. So we're seeing more controlled listings of units coming onto the market. And that's one of the reasons why whilst home prices for standalone houses are quite strong at the moment, the prices for units continue to slide in many areas. And in some of these high um, stressed areas, um, they are continuing to slide 
quite significantly in some places 20 and 30 percent so don't be deceived not all property prices for all types of property in all locations are buoyant it is just not true okay and then if i go to financial stress this is the um, overall aggregated numbers so the postcode at the top 3000 melbourne at 79.82 percent then we go to lethbridge park in new south wales cranbourne in victoria grey stains went with phil and westmead and then we go to Millbank and areas around there, including Bundaberg. Then we go back to Narry Warren, Narry Warren Far South, Hooper's Crossing, Hopper's Crossing. I always get that wrong. Hopper's Crossing. Apologies. Uh, Ipswich. And uh, so it goes on. Uh, and so this is the way of trying to understand what's really going on at a granular level. And that's why I keep saying you've got to understand stuff locally you can't just talk about high level averages and you know, all, all the indices and of course they've all come out this month with massively high indices claiming everything is booming well it's not there are significant areas where prices are not doing the same as what people would expect them to be doing based on those high level numbers so go granular is my message now let me just then sw quickly switch to stress mapping because um one of the most powerful ways of showing this is to show you the color coding and the mapping that we do. And so each month, as you know, we actually do quite a lot of detailed geo mapping. And so the blue means low stress, the orangey red means high stress. So if I pull out from New South Wales, uh, Sydney, you can see as we pull out, we start to get a bit of a picture in terms of where those high stressed areas are and in fact um, typically of course it's western sydney where the issues are you can see as we pull out you can start to see the um, areas that are beginning to register in terms of high stress now this is actually the count of households rather than the percentage which i did last time so this is the count of households so the darkest colours mean more than 7,700 households in the particular area. And you can see there that relative to close in to the city, Western Sydney is where a lot of the issues are. Now, if I then do the same for, um, uh, let's go to 3,000. OK, so we're now going to look at Melbourne. The same process, same coding. Uh, the... Uh, bands stay the same and so we pull out and we discover that you know close in there is some issues but not dramatic but when you start pulling out from the center of melbourne out and you start to see the surrounding high growth corridors then it all sort of gets quite clear and you can see places like narrow warren it's down there berwick and harkaway um, the areas of course to the west of uh, melbourne as well and to the north as well um, so there's a surrounding area around the city that is really highly stressed in those high development areas and beyond. And in fact, if you pull out to regional New, uh, Melbourne, Victoria, you can start seeing that places like, um, uh, you know, further out here, there are, are also um, registering as well. And, and so, again, you've got to go granular, right? You can't just sort of talk averages. You've got to look at um, individual areas. Now, if I then do the same for... Um, 4,000. So this is uh, Brisbane, of course, in the area. Stress is not as bad here, so but there are some um, areas where it's beginning to uh, come to be a bit of an issue. You can see there north of the city. Um, we're starting to see some of the dark colours. Not the same dramatic dark uh, colours as we saw in and around Sydney or Melbourne. But as you pull out, you can begin to see Ipswich around there, you know, the same sort of problems as I highlighted earlier on now in map format. And if you go out to far enough, you can begin to see some very interesting and concerning areas. Nothing like the stress levels that we have in Sydney and Melbourne. But nevertheless, there are significant numbers and significant pockets where stress is quite high. Now, I'll just continue that uh, journey of postcodes if I go to 5,000. Okay, so here's now 5,000, so around Adelaide. And once again, if we pull out, we can begin to see that the stress levels 
Um, not too bad in some areas, but as you go north, particularly of the city, um, you start seeing, and then it begins to get a little bit uh, awkward further south as well. But uh, Salisbury North, places like that, has uh, always been the hot spot, and it continues to be the hot spot in and around Adelaide. Um, if we then do the uh, 6,000, so we're now over in the west, looking at Perth. And once again, as you pull out, you can see how the stress varies by locations. As you go north of Perth, you start seeing it. As you go south of Perth, you start seeing it. Some of those new high growth areas still registering as significantly stressed. And as you pull out further, you can see the patterns quite clearly. Um, now, what's quite interesting is that some of these stressed areas, the price rises are nothing like they are close into the city of Perth. So again, you've got to be very careful when you actually watch the information about, uh, about Perth itself. It is not uniformly buoyant. And of course, if the iron ore situation falls over, and there's a chance it might, if China gets really cross with us, um, that could be a big issue for the West as well. And if we just quickly go to Tassie, you can see there that Tasmania has its own problems. Um, the issue with Tassie, of course, is that prices are very high relative to incomes. And so we do see levels of stress, um, not dramatically so, but there are a number of areas where stress is definitely on the radar. Now, I could just do a little bit on rental stress, just for comparison purposes. Um, and with all of those, um, you know, the, the situation is, again, all about granularity. So let's start in Sydney. This is now looking at rental stress. And the picture is a bit different. You can see there that Bondi is actually registering. The city is also registering high levels of stress there compared with what we saw in the previous one. But as you pull out, you then start to see the same pattern with regard to the West. So you can begin to see that there's actually quite a lot of issues. Liverpool, places like that. Um, you know, it's all very much of a much as Campbelltown. And so it goes on. So issues in the West, but also pockets closer in. And uh, that's pretty much repeated if you do... Um, 3,000, come down to Victoria. And just the same sort of scenario comes up again with um, levels of stress registering. Rental stress is a real issue, so even closer into town there's some, but as you go further out, look at this, the big swathes around Wyndham, 3029. And as you pull out further, you can see the same sort of things going on. So again, it's not surprising that uh, financial stress overall is high because you've got investors struggling, you've got um, renters struggling, and you've got people with mortgages struggling. And I'll just do uh, one more. I'll just do the West. I don't have time to do all of the um, views for all of the postcodes. Uh, it's way too complicated to do, and we'd be here all night. But it is quite interesting just watching what's going on. So this is the rental stress. So rental stress in the West, not too much of an issue, although rents are going up quite fast. People are having to pay a lot more. People are being asked to pay for months and ahead to secure a particular location. So you can see there's a bit of pressure there. And as you go out further from the centre, the pressure rises, but it's not as severe as in the um, down the East Coast. So there you go. That's a little bit about... Um, our, uh, our stress mapping and what we've done there. Um, it's a pretty important um, conversation, frankly, to um, get a sense of uh, you know, what's going on and, very importantly, where it might lead. Um, I say to people, you need to understand, you really need to understand what it's like on the ground. You can't just talk about high-level averages. It doesn't tell you anything. Now, just before I finish this part of the presentation, our scenarios, um, I've explained before already, I think, that scenarios are just a way of exploring different futures, different alternatives. I'm not saying it's going to be right, but it's quite interesting to see. And in fact, this month, 
there's been hardly any change to the scenario base. So there is still a significant probability of price rises. Um, somewhere between um, uh, uh, 25 to 35% is quite possible in some locations. Depends, of course, on units versus houses. But there is also this question of what happens if the virus keeps wobbling around and if we get um, a longer-term crunch, well, that could be a rather negative uh, factor in things. And indeed, if we had a really severe, severe wave nationally, prices could still fall. But at the moment, the probability is up here in the, in the top area. Um, I think the RBA is rather positive too positive probably but uh, nevertheless um you know the fact of the matter is um it looks to me as though there is upside for property in the short term i think later in the year though that may change we'll see i'll model this every month and uh, update it each month but you know even if we have a um, rise of somewhere between 15 and 30 percent over the next two to three years so i'm looking not just in 12 months but beyond um, that would be very high people will be in more debt and of course more debt leads to more exposure particularly if rates start to rise and as i've highlighted earlier on i expect rates to rise so that's essentially a rather different scenario than many people are expecting and so just to be clear folks um property bear property bull well i've got my different scenarios at the moment i'm on the more bullish side of the scenario but i'm also aware of the downside risks and just to explain this 80 percent one this is a very unlikely probability at the moment but if things really unwound if we had a significant financial collapse not just here but in other places around the world um, there is a significant downdraft to prices for property now, of course, in the UK and in the US, in global financial crisis terms, they were down 35 to 40 percent. So that is certainly feasible in a really severe crisis when essentially everything falls over could be even more so. So I keep that one on the radar, but that's not a central case for me. I'm really looking at these three in the middle. OK, so that's pretty much that. And now what I can do is just give you a little bit of an update and um, talk a little bit about the um, tool and i will also um give you just a little bit of uh, demonstration of uh, the tool let me just go here okay so this is the tool that's now available anybody in our patreon scheme at uh, 50 us dollars a month can access this directly and um, i'm just going to start by answering some of those from beforehand so 4556 was the one that uh, came up first and um, if we go for 4556 you gives you a bit of a flavor of the um, way the model works so this is the information that's available for every postcode and uh, essentially for 4556 that includes um, uh, civic downs and a few other places as well 17,400 households of which 7,000 borrowing and 7,000 are renting there's around 5,000 properties for rent and about 6,000 renters. Overall financial stress is 35%. That's quite low relative to some other areas. Mild stress, 2,499. Uh, no severe stress, 36%. Default rates at 3%. And the rental stress, um, 28%. That's pretty low. And investor stress at 28%. So this is not a postcode that's in dire straits at the moment. And over three years, we are thinking best case scenario could be a price rise for houses of around 14 percent for units about 10 percent but if those less um, positive cases play out in other words if the virus comes back and we have to lock down for longer then effectively the scenarios get negative and uh, over three years worst case down about three or four percent um, for houses and about 2.7 percent for units so that's that one and then there was another one at 4670 whoops Four six seven zero. As I say, this is all available now for if, for if you want to sign up on the Patreon channel. Uh, you can get access to all this information anytime, and you can also make comparisons between different types of uh, um, uh, postcodes as well, which I'll show you that in a second. Okay, four six seven zero. Um, so this is um, a very long list of places, which I'm not going to uh, uh, read out what Windham is on the list. Thirty six thousand. Households, 11,000 borrowing, 16,000 renting, 12,000 renter properties, and 13,000 renters. 39% in financial stress. Mild stress at 25%, 2,800. No severe stress. 4% defaults. 
a bit higher than some other areas. 49% in rental stress getting a bit higher and investor stress a bit higher at 31%. Overall over three years, 14% for houses, 9.8% for units is my best case scenario over three years. Worst case scenario, 4 to 4% over three years for houses and 3% for units. Okay, next one, 6-1. Six, one. Six, one. Oh, one. This is Slackra. Who oh, asked so for this one? Six, one, oh, one. Look up. Okay. So this is uh, Kalal East Victoria Park. That's area. Seven thousand seven hundred households. Two thousand seven hundred borrowing. Four thousand hundred renting. Um, Three thousand properties for rent. Two thousand one hundred renting. Forty-three <coughs> percent financial stress. Just gonna take a drink, excuse me a second. Mild mortgage stress, 1,200, 45%, that's a bit higher. 5% in default. We're seeing default rates in WA rising at the moment, actually, not falling. 30% in rental stress and 31% investors. And over three years, 9% rise for houses, best case, worst case down 9%. 6.6% for units, best case, 66 .6 minus worst case. So that's that one. And I'll just do 6053 and then I'll stop and get some questions from the audience. 6053. Okay, 6053, which includes Bayswater. Uh, <clears throat> So 6,500 houses, 3,000 borrowing, 2,700 renting, just over 2,000 properties for rent. And um, rentals, well, 25% financial stress, 22% um, mortgage stress, 4% defaults, 21% in rental stress, and 28% in investor stress. So it's not a huge amount. So basically I look at this financial stress and if it gets what affords 40%, I get worried below that. I'm significantly less worried. And that's the first four that I got asked to do. I've got another one, two, three, four, five to do, which I'll do shortly. But let me um, have a little go here and uh, just see what uh, what's going on. And uh, then we'll come back and um, uh, see what else we're going to talk about. Let me put that on there for a moment just to give everybody a bit of a rest. Um, Okay, a lot of uh, stuff in the chat which I haven't really got through to. Okay, so okay, have we got? Have we got? Have we got the question? Yes, we have. So the question is running. That's good. That's good. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't um, have a chance to see whether a smooth operator posted it, but I think he did. So that's great. And um, watching the uh, the various um. Uh, Vanessa asked this question is it better to live in ta Tapping or Mandra um, well judging by what I'm seeing in the data I think Mandra is still one to be a little bit cautious of um, not only are the social issues probably worse than in Tapping uh, but the um, price falls have been most significant on the other hand you might be able to pick a real bargain because there are lots of people struggling there to uh, work out what to do um, probably investors definitely struggling with uh, some of that um, <laughs> James says, and he's quite right, probably will be a liability if the government goes broke and tax creep becomes worse. Yeah, tax creep, I think we've got to be careful in this because, you know, Victoria actually started putting taxes up, particularly for some businesses, right, before the last lockdown. Um, that's an early harbinger of what's going to happen. Somehow, somehow they're going to have to work out how to repay this at some point. Now, of course, everybody says, well, hang on a moment, MMT says you never have to repay it. Well, you know, my view would be there, well, eventually you will have to repay it in some way. It's just a matter of when and how. So um, now AI made this an interesting point. Um, I wouldn't consider the affluent to be financially stressed as they adjust their budgets if they really wanted to. Do you agree or disagree? No, I don't agree. Uh, a lot of um, the affluent people are really um, stressed because they don't have cash flow, right? So, so sure, they've got assets. They could sell. They could sell property and those sorts of things. But on a cash flow basis, they actually fit my, um, my definition of being stressed. Now, the stress that they've got is manageable 
because they can sell property or they can do things, right? Whereas those on the um, outer suburban ring, you know, perhaps younger people, first-time buyers, they have no wriggle room at all. So they may have a chance to get out of jail. But remember, I'm measuring stress, not default, right? I'm measuring financial pressure on households, not default scenarios. So that's why it's relevant and appropriate to talk about those more affluent households. Okay, so smooth operator. Have I got the question? I think I probably have there. Um, that's the question. Name this famous town. So it's all about naming the town. The MTV video of the song Never As Good As The First Time shows Sade riding a black stand into a strange town which could be mistaken for a set from a Clint Eastwood movie. Name this famous town. All right, so that's the question that was posed. And uh, we're just up in a second to nine o'clock, so uh, uh, we'll uh, assume a number of people have put their um, answers up, and uh, at nine o'clock we'll um, close out that question, but uh, there you go, that's the uh, one. And now, Cross Stitch Ange says, interested in um, 4065. 4065, yeah, we can do that. Hang on a moment. Let me just go here first. Okay, 4065, so I'm just going to switch back to there and get rid of that so you can see it. So this is 4065, this is Baden. 3663 households, 1,000 acres of borrowing, 1,000 acres of renting, 42% in financial stress. There are 18% in mortgage stress, that's pretty low, that's pretty good, and rental stress is at 38%. So there's more rental stress than mortgage stress. Probably investors therefore have a bit more of an issue than the mortgage holders, and that's because of this issue of um, getting people who can pay rent and the cost of investment property. Overall, over three years, we're looking at a rise of, best case, about 13% for houses and about 9.8% for units. On the other hand, a fall of 4.6 or 3.4 respectively if things go really pear-shaped. So there you go, that's that one. Okay, what else have we got? <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> uh, I love some of the dis debate about the uh, question. So um, I'll leave everybody to... Uh, <laughs> James said, I see a UFO on the, uh, on the stress map. Could well be. Uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, amazing what you see. Um, uh, Logan made the point that uh, there are some ethnic uh, um, roots in some of those. That's one of the things I do actually highlight in my analysis, what I call my first generation migrants to Australia. A lot of them are in those high growth corridors. A lot of them are actually overcommitted on mortgages. They actually have a significant um, uh, issues with regard to uh, maintaining those mortgages. And of course, quite often what happens is the, the, um, the whole issue of uh, maintaining employment to be able to make the mortgages work is what's driving a lot of the behaviour in that area. So I agree with you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, KNG says, we've been saying a housing crash since 2011 when Sydney median prices were 250k. Today it's 1.2 million. Yep. Well, you know, you've got to understand, again, I have always used scenarios. I've always had the different outcomes. So just saying, uh, broadly as you do, housing crash is not actually fairly representing what I've said at any point, at any time. All I'm saying is be cautious, be careful, because you can easily get in over your head. And, you know, given where we are with high levels of debt, etc., etc., people should be cautious. But you need to understand my scenarios, not just read the headline from uh, newspapers who decide to take a particular line and don't give it a uh, fair, accurate representation of what I really say. <sighs> Vincent says, with the end of JobKeeper and JobSeeker, mortgage and rental returns, are your thoughts on the future of the economy? Yeah, um, there is a very interesting thing going on, Vincent, as you rightly say. Of course, the external factor of commodities, the latest trade data that came out today highlighted that the trade gap was, was very good, very positive, and that's because of iron ore, basically. Iron ore price is down a bit, but still very strong. If China were to turn off iron ore, um, that would be a big issue for us. But uh, if that um, doesn't happen, then the economic dynamo of 
the resources sector will continue. The question is, is that going to be sufficient to maintain the rest of the economy? And that's my point from earlier on about unless businesses start investing in things, unless we actually start seeing the momentum in the broader economy, that's going to be a big deal. So um, what I want to say is that um, the end of JobKeeper and JobSeeker is a big deal. Um, we are seeing a number of households able to get back to work and do their things. But of course, then we've got the lockdown. And so the lockdown has the potential to turn some people um, back into financial difficulty again. And remember what I said, the overall level of financial stress has gone up from 32% before the crisis to 41% now. It's not coming down yet. So people are very vulnerable and exposed when interest rates are very, very low. So there's, the risk that I see is that a lot could actually change and create a lot of pressure for a lot of households. Now, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll be all right. But um, I don't think it's um, as simple as saying we'll be fine because of a commodities. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. OK, here's, here's another postcode. Can you bring up 2200? Sure can. OK, 2200. Whoops, 22. I typed too fast, then I have to retype it. Ah <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. It's all great fun, isn't it? Okay, okay, here we go. Let me get rid of the VAT so you can see it. Um, okay, so this is 2200. So this is Bankstown, Condal Park. 14,800 households, 4,600 borrowing, 7,900 renting. So a lot of renting going on there. Um, more than um, rental property owners, 4,000 4, and 6,000 properties for rent. 58% in rental stress. So that's quite high. And financial stress, 58, that's quite high. Anything above 40, as I said, is uh, alerting. Within that, though, it's not mortgages. So mortgages are okay. 26% in mortgage stress, 1,100. It's renting. 70%, 77% of people in rental stress at 6,000. And property investors, 40% of property investors are in difficulty, 1,300 um, stressed of which 285 are severely stressed. Now, the severely stressed ones are the ones being forced to sell, and that's because the cash flow issues on their rental property are impossible to solve. Nevertheless, we're looking at a price rise over three years of 7%, good best case, or down 11% worst case for houses, or up 5% for units, or down 8% for units. So you can see there the different scenarios that we, that we actually run. So there you go. hope that's useful. <coughs> OK, what else have we got? OK, <laughs> junk bonds makes the point. Thank you. 343 watching. Well, it's actually 347 now, but there you go. Uh, 128 likes. Folks, please like the show. If you've spent some time with me tonight, do please take the time just to click that little like button. Not really that hard to do, is it? It really does make a difference. So please do that. OK. Logan says landlord in Victoria need a good lesson. They're having the lesson. Many landlords are really, really struggling. So if you talk to landlords of apartments, those who bought perhaps several apartments a few years ago, uh, they are really up against it now. Of course, there's still a lot of new construction going on in both um, Victoria and New South Wales. Remember those building um, approval numbers I, I shared earlier on? One of the interesting things is that the momentum for units in Victoria has fallen through the floor. So a lot of people not building new stuff. There's a lot of old stuff still available for rent. And if you go into places like Docklands and around there, um, of course, that would have been perhaps student accommodation previously. Well, the students didn't come back. Go out towards Monash, a lot down there as well. A lot of people are learning the lesson the hard way. And remember, I've showed some data the other month about the number of investment properties um, in negative cash flow, more than half in Victoria. OK, OK. Thank you, AI. I appreciate that and your answer. So that'll be good. Um, uh, we'll know very soon when I get to it whether um, that was the right answer or not. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. What is acceptable stress level, says TB? Interesting question. So what I basically say is that 
you know, there will always be some people who will have some difficulties. And, you know, the, the, the likelihood is stress could be perhaps short term and, uh, you know, you can get out of it. But what I find quite often is that once people have um, a level of stress for a few months, they unless they change their behavior, it never actually sorts itself out. And if you start seeing multiple levels of stress in the same area, it tends to have a very significant negative drag on prices, rents, sales, and all those sorts of things. So once you see a level of 40% and above, that's a real warning in my model. And quite often what I see in the warning signs is early stress levels. Later on, it often translates to defaults. And you know, Manda was the old um, classic case that I keep coming back to because I've been watching that one very closely for a long time in WA, right? And we started seeing the stress rise, then we started seeing the defaults rise, then we started seeing the prices fall down 30%. They've come back a little bit, but there are still many property investors over there who are really struggling. So essentially, that 40% level is a really important threshold. James, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, OK. <laughs> what else have we got? OK, OK. Lots of interesting questions. A cheap beer from Victoria. Can't get on the beers. Hopefully Thursday is not bad news, but we are resilient. We'll get through it. Stay strong. Stay safe. Yep, very good point. Yep. Absolutely. Hang in there. Hang in there. OK, um, now let me go back and do a few more postcodes. Um, I've got lots on my list from earlier on. And I've got to, uh, I did promise to do all of those that asked. OK, so 2750 from NA. 2750. Look up. OK, so this is 2750, um, <clears throat> the area around Emu Plains and Penrith. 18,300 households, 7,000 borrowing, 8,000 renting, 6,000 rent, and about 4,000 property rental owners. 40%, so yeah, you're on the threshold there, 40%. And 3,000 mild mortgage stress, 44% in mortgage stress. That's quite high. 1% defaults, it's around 99%. 46% in rental stress, 3,700. 24% of investors stressed, about 450. And in terms of price rises, we're seeing about 8.4% over three years in that particular postcode. Best case. Worst case, down about 9.9. For units, best case, about 6%. Worst case, about 7%. So that gives you a bit of a flavour. This is a threshold level, as I've mentioned before, 40%, 44%. Mortgage stress is an issue. Rental stress is an issue. So far, the investors seem to be getting away relatively scot-free. But We'll see how long that goes on for. So that's that one. And I've got another one then to go to do. And that was uh, postcode um, 3145. 3145. OK. 3145. Look it up. Off we go again. So 3145 is Malvern East and places like that, Caulfield East. 9,500 uh, there with households, 3,200 borrowing, 4,100 renting, 3,100 properties for rent, 4,100 rental property owners and 39% in financial stress. Mild mortgage stress is 596 severe stress 237 now i'm just want to underscore the severe stress means there's severity underwater we're seeing quite a lot of that in and around melbourne at the moment not least because of the lockdowns 26 percent in mortgage stress not very high four percent in default rental stress 26 property investors 47 percent and again property investors begin to struggle and that's coming through in some of those 108 in severe stress in terms of price movements, 9%, um, highest for houses over three years, down 8% uh, over three years in the bearish case. For units, not so high, 6.9% and minus 6%. That's that one. And um, what else have we got? 
let's have a look a lot more conversations going on there plenty <laughs> plenty happening in the chat I'd like to see that um, Daniel asks for whoops Daniel asks for 2050 sure thing can do that let's just get myself there Two, oh. you can do this for yourself if you sign up for the uh, Patreon you can then go in and do your own analysis and do the cross comparisons of different um, areas too but anyway let me just show you this this is the um, uh, 2050 so 5,400 households 1,200 borrowing 3,900 renting 2,900 for rent and uh, 2,600 probably investors in the area 78% in financial stress that's a really big number I think that's the biggest we've seen so far so Camperdown is an issue uh, in terms of mortgage stress not a lot going on uh, default rates quite low but it's all in the investment sector 71% of renters 2,788 struggling and look at this property investors 79% uh, 1,396 stressed investors of which 698 are severely stressed so it's the investment sector that's really struggling at the moment there and some of that I think you'll find will be because we're not seeing the students coming back and, and you know the education sector would have been uh, quite strong in this area so a lot of uh, rental property is um, uh, vacant and we're also seeing quite a few people who just don't have the hours um, you know they're working temporary jobs to try and pay the rent so that's one of the reasons why this area is significantly at risk at 78 percent that's a big number overall houses up 6.8 percent over three years best case worst case down 11 percent five percent for units and six down 8.4 percent if you take the worst case scenario so that's that one and I'll take that off for a second see what else we've got okay now Jack asks for tra la rogon I think that's called I love some of these names it's a great way of getting to know more about Australia and all the different locations there are you know doing this um, <laughs> so that's three eight three eight four four okay Get up. 3844. 4. 12,900 households, 5,400 borrowing, 5,200 renting, 4,000 properties for rent, and 3,400 rental owners. 43%, excuse me, 43% in financial stress, 3,906 in mild stress, 72% big stress, big mortgage stress in the area, 3% default, 146. Rental stress, 24% not so bad investor stress only 13 percent not too bad so this is a mortgage stress suburb this will be people perhaps bought relatively recently exposed now um, you know and it's uh, quite often the case that it takes a little while for this to work through but nevertheless that's not good news overall price rises nine percent over three years in my bullish case down eight percent in my bearish case for houses units up six percent and down six percent so that's the story there can I do postcode whoops I got too many Mises on the table hang on <laughs> there we go 2008 yeah sure can and um, just to explain I've had a few experiments with different types of Mises setups and different buttons and if I found that having different Mises on the different computers is the <laughs> is the best way to do it otherwise it gets very confusing when I keep pushing buttons and switch from one to the other I've tried a KVM and things it just doesn't work so that's just where we are okay um, so this is 2008 that's Chippendale and Darlington 5,600 in stress borrowing 822 renting 4,500 properties for rent 3,400 property investors 2,100 78 percent in financial stress big number but within that it's not mortgage stress is the problem here pretty good defaults are pretty low it's rental stress 
and probably investor stress. So we're seeing quite a few people with rentals struggling and we're seeing probably investors um, just not getting the returns they need to be able to make the returns. And I guess if you think about it, again, it's quite close into places like Redfern and Chinatown. Um, so again, it would be very much student based, very much, um, you know, the education sector that would be actually feeling that. So maybe not surprising. A lot of people are trying to sell in the area. Uh, one reasons why the projections with regard to prices is only 6% up over three years for houses, down 11% worst case for units up 5% or down 8%, depending on the scenario that you play. So that's that one. And a lot of these close-in suburbs, you know, when you start looking at them closely, you realise that close into the city centres, a lot of them are really, really struggling. And uh, I think we're going to see more of that ahead as well. OK, can I do 0820? I'll give it a go. 0808. To O. Whoops. O. Eight. Two. O. I um, should. Okay. Eight. Two. O. Go. Look up. There you go. So this is um, uh, one of the some. Yeah. Okay. Northern Territory. Nine thousand three hundred households. 2,000 borrowing, 6,400 renting, 4,900 properties for rent, 1,700 investment owners, 21% in financial stress. It's pretty low. Mortgage stress is 28% or 602. Rental stress at 16% or 1,031. Investor stress at 21% or 360. So not a huge um, sort of set of issues there at the moment. Uh, growth around 10% over the next three years for houses, best case, down 8%, worst case for units, up 6.8%, down 6.1%. Not that many units, I suspect, there in the area, but uh, that should give you a bit of flavour. I try to do units and houses where I can, just to give people a relative comparison. Well, we're at 919 already. Can you believe it? I don't know what happened. Um, I've got um, a few more postcodes to do. <laughs> 3109 and I've also got the ones from earlier on so we'll try and get to them 3109 the pines etc okay here we go 11,000 push that there you go 11,029 3,956 borrowing, 3,700 renting, 2,800 properties for rent, 3,700 rental property owners, 39% in financial stress, 36% in mortgage stress at 1,413, 52% in rental stress at 1,936, 28% in investor stress, 985 with 60 in severe stress. So again, it's renters that really is the action point there. And over the next three years, more than 9% up is likely my best case, down 9% worst case for units up 6.8% or down 6.9%. It's interesting how sym symmetric those things have become. Depends on the outcomes, of course, that we look at. So there you go, that's that one. Oh. Let's go back to there. Logan makes the point, which is quite a good one. When they set the USA loose, watch the inflation go bang. Yeah, well, you know, there's a big debate. Is inflation strategic or is it just tactical? You know, is it sort of short-term transitory? Watch this space. We'll know soon. Um, the stuff in the US, more people are beginning to say, well, maybe it is transitory, but we'll see. And certainly the bond rates are suggesting it's more than transitory, but we'll see. Uh, here we go, another one, 2607. Bung that in there. 2607. Here we go in the ACT. Let's just make sure that comes up so you can see it. Get rid of that. Okay, so this is um, 2607 in the ACT, 5800. Uh, households, 2,100 borrowing, 2,200 renting, 1,600 properties for rent, and number of rental property owners, 2,300, 27% in financial stress, 24% in mortgage stress, 
497, 18% in rental stress at 390, 31% in investor stress, with 36 in severe stress and 679 just in stress. A bit of selling pressure there for some investors. Overall, 10% over three years is quite likely. Um, a fall of 8% worst case for houses, not as much for units 7.5 or down 6%. So that's that one. Okay, another one here we'll do, and then I'll come back and do the um, ones that I took at the beginning of the show and make sure I cover those. Um, four, five, five, six, four, five, five, six, four, five, five, six. Okay, so here we have um, Sippy Downs and places like that. 17,400 households, 7,000 borrowing, 7,000 renting, 5,200 properties for rent, 6,100 rental property owners, 35% overall financial stress. Mortgage stress is 36%, 2,499, 3% default rate at 313. Rental stress 28% at 1,952, and uh, investor stress at 28% too, interesting, 1,673. Price rises, 14.7% over three years. Best case for houses. Worst case, down 3.7% for units. Up 10% or down 2.7%. So more upside than downside in the Queensland area that we're looking at there. Of course, it's just in, in land from the Sunshine Coast. And uh, I've done a few shows uh, at some of the areas in around there. So look on the website if you want more information about some of those. OK, let me just go back to do these other ones that I said I would do. Um, 3036, let's put that in there. So these are the ones I picked up from the chat before we started. I like to keep my promises when I can. OK, Kilo. OK, here we go, there's Kilo. And um, in Kilo, 2,300 households, 99, Sorry, 965 borrowing, 603 renting, 467 properties for rent, 1,300 uh, rental properties, 34% in financial stress. The mortgage stress is 50% at 483, that's quite high, 3% defaults. Not really much rental stress happening, 24% of property investors struggling. One of the things I'd highlight is there's plenty of stuff there available. I think that's probably part of the reason for that story. And overall, 11% rise for houses, best case. Worst case, down 7.7%. For units, up 7.7% and down 5.5%. Um, done 820, that was the, also asked for. And then I'll do 3844. Okay, make sure that we get that one. 3844. So that's uh, places like um, Flynn, for example, 12,000, 12,978, of which 5,400 are borrowing, 5,200 are renting, 4,000 properties for rent, 3,245 rental property owners at 43%, 72% in mortgage stress, that's a big number, 3,906. 3% default rates, 146. 24% rental stress at 1,225. And 13% or 252 renters, uh, investors. So this is a mortgage stress story. Uh, overall, 9% rise in houses over three years, compared with a fall of 8.9% in the worst case scenario. Units up 6.6 or down 6.5. OK, so that's the ones I got beforehand. Um, we're running out of time fast. Let me just quickly run down here. Um, what else haven't I got? Um, did I do that one? 3145. I don't know. Did I do 3145? Yes, I did. So I did that one earlier on. I think. Yeah, I did Marvin East earlier on. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, did that one. Fridge in the fridge, 3042. 3042, can do. 3042. Oh, come on, 
O2. Uh, 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 uh. 3042. We help if I could type, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, Keller Park, F, Port West, yeah. Nah, 6,986 6, households. Let's get rid of that so you can see it. There you go. 2,500 borrowing, 2,400 renting, 1,900 properties for rent, 1,700 investment property owners, 49% in financial stress, 62% in mortgage stress at 1,570, 3% default rates, 57% in rental stress at 1,413, 24% in investor stress, 49% severely stressed, 369 in total. So a bit of an issue, a bit of an issue that one. Overall price rises for houses 8% over three years, best case, down 10%, worst case, units up 6% down 7.5% over three years. Okay. One Burjo. Hello. <laughs> 4551. Can try that. 4551. Okay. And look up. So this is Queensland postcode 4551, Caloundra, places like that, Little Mountain, Moffat Beach, 26,665, 8,300 borrowing, 12,200 renting, 9,100 properties for rent, 9,800 rental property owners, 45% financial stress. Mortgage stress is 33%, 2,772, 3% default rates, 242. Rental stress, 49%. 5,959 going up. I can tell you that's a significant issue there. And investor stress 36%, 3,185, of which severe stress 332. And in my sub projections, up 13.6% over three years, best case scenario for houses, worst case down 4.8%. For units, best case 10%, down, worst case minus 3.5%. So there you go. Hope I've saved your life. Okay, here's another one. Two, one, three, five. Did I do that one before? I'm not sure. I get to the point where I've done so many that I sort of lose count of whether I've done it. But I'll just put it back in and see what happens if I recognise it. Two, one, three, five. Strathfield. No, it's a new one. I think Strathfield. Yep. Good question. Very interesting. Inner city, um, you know, suburban one. So, eight thousand eight hundred and fifty. Four households, 2,300 borrowing, 4,599 renting, 3,400 properties for rent. Number of rental property owners, 3,200. 50% in financial stress, 28% in mortgage stress, 4% in default, 50% in rental stress, 2,300. 57% in investor stress. So you can see across the board there, it's on the rental and investor side more than the owner occupied side but 28 percent is you know not in sub, uh, insubstantial and um, if you look at that overall 7.5 percent growth over three years is my best case for houses down 10 percent for units up 5.6 percent or down 7.8 percent for worst case okay 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 <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I'm going to run out of smoke quite soon. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come back and uh, just close out the rest of the show and then I'll pick up the last few postcodes if I can before I finally go off air. It's just that um, we are now running up against the deadline and I don't want to keep people hanging on longer than promised. Just be, oops, push the wrong button. That's not going to help anybody. Let's go there. OK, so just on just on the tool. Um, so that tool is available f if you sign up on Patreon, 50 US dollars a month. You can make comparisons between postcodes. You can make comparisons at state level, location level, SA2, SA3, as well as the postcode level. A lot of other information there and other information is coming. So, for example, Net rental yield will be in the model quite soon, and I've got other data coming through. So this is an ongoing evolution of the of the tool, and uh, I'd be interested to get more feedback as well in terms of uh, what may be happening uh, later. 
So with that, let me just uh, trip through to the end of the slides here and just go up to the, whoops, where's that? Here we go. OK, so that's the Q&A done. Um, in terms of uh, more information, walktheworld.com.au if you want to go there to get more information about what we do and also, of course, our own funds powered by Nucleus Wealth. Uh, there's also the DFA blog if you want more information. Uh, you can also contact me via the DFA blog using the, um, the, the, the tool there. Um, and if you've got a postcode that you want information for, send me a message via the DFA blog and I'll try and turn that around in two or three days details there. Uh, you can support our work on Patreon and uh, there are different tiers that are available there. This is quoted in US dollars. Depending on your setup you might see the Aussie dollar alternative. Um, and the $50 a month US is actually where you get all this information. So all of the data that I've showed tonight is available and they sent out um, accessible and those people who have on, the, on that tier at the moment have access credentials to get into the tool manipulate it themselves just like I was doing and can make a lot of comparisons you can download the data you can manipulate the data so that's how you get the full information set more than 2,000 postcodes um, in the data set and uh, as I say more information coming shortly um, you can support us by Bitcoin if you like that's a QR code a few people have done that always appreciate it and there's also a merch, as I always say, um, just in case you want to uh, support us that way. Now, in terms of next time, uh, there is a interesting conversation to be had with Adam Stokes, who's very much into crypto. We had him on a few months ago when, of course, crypto was booming. I want to have him back on and I'm going to discuss with him next week beyond crypto with Adam Stokes. What happens now? So that will be an interesting show. So mark your diary and uh, come and join us for a crypto uh, extravaganza next week who knows whether bitcoin will be at 30,000 40,000 50,000 and uh, what about those other coins as well where are they going to be so that'll be an interesting conversation and i think it will be a very fascinating show because i want to take the conversation further in terms of um can you be your own bank for example you know do you need banks anymore are banks obsolete all those things as well so that will be part of the conversation on next week's show so i look forward to seeing you then and now let's just quickly go back and um, anybody who uh, wants to drop off, you've heard the main part of the show now. So thank you for your time with us tonight. Pretty appreciated it. I will just do a few more postcodes for those who ask simply because I um, appreciate people coming on and um, basically asking for um, uh, my help. And I'm very happy to try and give it the best I can. But as I say, if in fact you uh, are unable to hang around, you can always send me a message on the DFA blog and I will then send you the same snapshot of information as uh, I've been sharing. Okay, Anthony asked for 3079, so let's do that. 307, 307, uh, There you go, let's just put that in there rid of that so you can see it okay so this is um ivanhoe ivanhoe east 6700 households 2300 borrowing 2600 renting 2000 uh also properties for rent and 1300 rental property owners 47 percent 91 percent in mortgage stress oh that's pretty high 2178 30 percent in rental stress at 823 13 percent in investor stress so it's a mortgage stress story we're seeing that of course in a lot of those outer areas around heidelberg and places like that as well so it's quite consistent house price projections 8.5 percent over three years best case down 10 percent worst case units up six percent down 7.2 percent and as i always say could change again you know that's just a a bit of a, a bit of a um a bit of a snapshot but that's how i see it at the moment and then um another one question here 6210 I can put that one in 6210 look it up okay that didn't work <laughs> I'm getting a bit tired 6210 pick it up look it up yeah okay so this is places like Falcon 
Um, and one up in Western Australia, 35,104 households, 11,600 borrowing, 17,600 renting. So renting is pretty much a thing over there. 13,000 or so properties for rent, 11,000 investors, 32% in financial stress, 70% in mortgage stress, 1,940, 34% in rental stress at 5,971 and 30% in investor stress with 113 severely stressed 10 percent rise over three years expected best case down 7.7 percent worst case for houses down 7 point uh, up 7.5 percent for units down 5.7 percent for units worst case okay so there you go uh zach asked for one seven one seven three uh, da, 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 da. 7173 7173 okay Carlton uh, this is like Carlton places like that in Tassie I'm going to get rid of the chat so you can see it 3,691 households 1,555 boring 1,667 or renting 1,276 properties for rent, 627 property investors at 55% in financial stress, that's quite high, rental stress um, at 35% or 480, investor stress at 25%, 442 and 12, but mortgage stress, 83%, 1,296 and 2% of defaults. Mortgage stress in Tasmania is very high, in fact it's the highest over the country so uh, as a proportion prices 7.2 percent higher over three years is my best case down 11 percent worst case for units it's five up or 8.3 down based on the scenario and uh, we'll do one more now this is from um ryan oops Let's get in there, put that in there. So 6025, 6025. Padbury and places like that. Western Australia, 12,227 households, 6,216 borrowings, 3,500 renting, 2,700 properties for rent, 3,600 rental property owners and 34% in financial stress, not too bad. 31% in mortgage stress at 1,954. 4% default rate, a bit higher than other some areas. 38% in rental stress, 1,337. 25% of investors in difficulty with 62 of those in severe stress and price 9.9% highest over three years, down 8.4% lowest. For units up 7.3% down 6.2 there you go uh, yeah, how many more have I got uh, I think I'm going to have to call it a night so those of you who weren't able to get my answer up tonight one more 3754 <laughs> uh, I know 37 five four okay please like the post guys please like the post it's really really important that you do that as i do this um this is doreen uh, victoria of 13,300 households in uh, there 9,100 borrowing 4,500 renting 3,400 renting properties and 2,500 investment owners, 68% financial stress, quite high, 57% mortgage stress, 5,279, 3% defaults, rental stress, 75%, 2,422, 3,422, 17% in investor stress. So rental stress, very high, in mortgage stress, pretty high, 7.8% over three years is my best case for houses or down 10% worst case. 5.6 higher, 36 months for units, down 8%. And Donna asked the question, very interesting question. Thank you, Donna, for that question. Um, does it mean more houses are likely to come on the market? Yeah, 
where you've got high levels of stress, it's almost always the case that there is going to put extra imperative on people to list. At the moment, some property investors are there at the moment. So in my surveys, particularly property investors with units that are struggling to let them, are thinking of trying to sell into the rising market, or the <laughs> units rising market is a bit of a question, right? Uh, we know that some mortgage holders are also in difficulty because they've no longer got the uh, government support and the, um, the bank support, so they're having to make their mortgage repayments. That's why mortgage stress is rising, as I showed you earlier on. We're going to see some more of those coming on later in the year. My expectation will be that we will have more listings coming on, forced listings, which means that potentially prices won't be as strong, which means that essentially that might be the turning point in terms of prices. We'll see. Well, I, <sighs> yeah, I want to help everyone. I do want to help everyone, but unfortunately I've run out of smoke. <laughs> I turned into a pumpkin at uh, 9.45. So, um, look, we, I think we're done. So I thank you very much for all of your comments. I don't know what happened with regards to the um, question. I'll look back over the stream, assuming somebody got it right. Um, I'll go through and uh, pull out those who got it right and I'll announce tomorrow who's got the uh, opportunity to have a free conversation with me on a particular suburb, basically going through this data in more detail and also the other stuff. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation more generally, uh, always open to it. Um, as I say, I'm booking quite far ahead at the moment because there are so many people that essentially are wanting it. So there we are. And um, thank you very much. Have a good night. Um, thanks, Logan. Uh, uh, thank you, no trigger, that's good. Um, appreciate that. Please do like the post on the way out. Okay. And uh, Smooth Operator just gave, uh, there, there you go, three or four people there came up with some um, uh, of the right answer. So we'll um, thank you very much for making my life easier, Smooth Operator. We'll run a bit of a, um, a random. I'll do a random generator and uh, we'll produce an answer and uh, keep up that. Uh, thank you very much, Smooth Operator, for the question. That was good. Thanks, Will. Appreciate that. Um, let the dogs take over. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dogs are quietly asleep now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Zach says, um, Cookie Boy, when's your show with me? Good question. <laughs> and... Uh, Thank you, not appreciate that. Um, glad it helps. I'm trying just to provide, you know, perspective and to help people make better decisions. That's what we're here. So I hope you found it useful tonight. I want to say thank you very much for your spending time with me on the show tonight. Um, thank you very much for all those who made a contribution via the uh, smart chat. For those of you who are participated in the chat and for those of you who asked questions and hopefully I was able to provide some answers. Uh, as I said earlier on, next week, um, of course, we'll be talking crypto, so that'll be fun. I look forward to seeing you there. And uh, have a safe evening for those people in uh, Melbourne. Um, I hope very much that you, you stay safe and uh, that the lockdown comes on in very soon. And for those in the other states, stay safe as well and uh, keep well. And um, I look forward to seeing you same time, same station next week. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.